it is an honor to be here. I appreciate you uh, uh, attending this uh, discussion on creation and evolution. And I certainly appreciate the good spirit I've always gotten when I've done debates with Terry Pruitt. I'm glad that he's open-minded, and we're going to try to convert him today. Uh, <laughs> He'll be a great asset to the creation side when we get him converted over. Uh, I was a high school science teacher, as Chuck said, for 15 years, and now for 10 years I've dedicated my life to traveling all over the world and speaking on this topic, creation and evolution. Basically, there are only two options. Like the Russian astronomer said, either there is a God or there isn't. Both possibilities are frightening. If there is a God, then we better find out who he is and what he wants and do what he says. If there isn't a God, we are in trouble. Because we're racing around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's in charge. A frightening thought. You know, there are four great questions to this life. Every religion in the world, including atheism, tries to answer the four fundamental questions of life. The way you answer these questions depends upon which way you view the world. And there's only two choices, creation or evolution. Now, if the evolution theory is true, they say, you know, it's amazing. A big bang made this whole place from nothing. That's the humanist worldview that says man is God. Now, that's a very appealing religion because then you get to decide what's right and wrong. Nobody tells you what to do. That'd be great to be your own God. Then there are no rules. The other way to look at the world is to say, you know, it's incredible design. There must be a designer. That's the creationist worldview, which says God is God. And these two worldviews are at war with each other. As even Sir Arthur Keith said, he wrote the foreword to Darwin's reprint in 1959. And he believed in evolution. And he said, folks, these two, few, these two philosophies, these two uh, worldviews are at war with each other. If the evolution theory is true, who am I and what am I worth? Well, if evolution is true, you're nothing important. You're just a piece of protoplasm that washed up on the beach, and you're not worth a thing. Matter of fact, you're part of the problem because you're one of the polluters of the environment. And the more of you we can get rid of, the better. That's normal thinking if evolution philosophy is true, I believe. Where did I come from? Well, if evolution is true, you came from a cosmic burp about 20 billion years ago. Why am I here? What is the purpose of life? Well, if evolution is true, there is no purpose to life. You might as well have fun. If it feels good, do it. Where am I going when I die? Well, if evolution is true, you're just going to the grave and you're going to get recycled into a worm or a plant. These two worldviews could not be more opposite. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Folks, if that verse is true, we better find out who he is and what he wants. And I've decided I'm going to do what God says or try to for my life, and I want to encourage you to do the same thing. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, we'd like to encourage you to at least open your mind just a little bit. We're going to try to show you some evidence that this world was created. It had to be designed, and the evolution theory has absolutely no evidence for it whatsoever. We offer a quarter of a million dollars for real scientific evidence for evolution. We think evolution is a philosophy, it's a religion, but it's not a science. Thank you. Uh, I'm Terry Pruitt, and I have been teaching evolution for something like 25 years. Uh, during the time that I've been engaged in that process, there have been tremendous changes in the fossil record and tremendous changes in our understanding of the processes through which human origins and the origins of all of the specific kinds of life on this planet or other life that we've ever encountered uh, are linked. We have been presented already with a number of questions, and although I'm not going to respond directly to Kent on all of the points at this point, I do want to uh, argue at least that uh, rather this being a yes or no, black or white, uh, design or no rules, uh, humans of no importance uh, or humans of great importance uh, kind of black and white question, I think there are many different levels of approach and of understanding, and, and the one that I represent today, more than even my uh, sort of deeper position, is the one of theistic evolution. I'm going to represent the theistic uh, evolutionary perspective today, in part because it otherwise would not be represented, and this debate would appear to be a contest between two sides, when in fact, it's a contest that involves many different elements in a continuum of ideas and processes and thoughts that have gone over many centuries. I want to contend today 
Uh, well, I have two strikes against me with at least part of the audience, I believe, because not only am I an evolutionist, but I'm also a form critic. And I understand that form criticism and textual criticism in the, in the Hebrew Bible uh, and, in, and in the Christian Bible are, are not necessarily popular things in some circles. But uh, I treat God's text, or what many would consider God's text, as a human product. It is a text about God, and it is a text about the particular beliefs that have given us the, the religious and many of the spiritual traditions of our time. I live in a world where the Bible is considered God's text, even if I don't treat it as my God's text. But uh, I also argue that the world, uh, which Kent has already asserted God created, is also God's text. And if we have a, an obligation to read the text of the Bible, then we also have an obligation to read the text of the world, and I don't believe Kent would disagree with me on that. And I'll leave that as my opening comment, and we'll come back in a little bit. Thank you. My name is Mike Schultz. I've been in this creation uh, uh, thing now for about seven years. Uh, I used to be a garbage man of all things, just taking <laughs> people's garbage out. And before I got saved, before I accepted Christ as my Savior, like the Bible says, and I've always been interested in this topic. This is what kept me from being saved for 23 years of my life. And I got saved. Then I really started to study this topic and realized that the Bible's true. I am not a theistic evolutionist. I believe that God created everything and he did it just like that. I don't think God has to use mutations in billions of years. I think the Bible, if you read it clearly, it clearly says God created everything in the beginning. I think Jesus put that uh, Adam and Eve, like Mark 10, 6 says, at the beginning. I don't believe in any form of evolution. I'm here today because basically of what 2 Peter 3, 3 says, I'll throw it up here on the board for you all. That's okay. 2 Peter 3, 3 basically says, Knowing this first, in the last days, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. I believe that's what's going on today. And it worries me. This is something that kept me from being saved for a long time. This is my first debate. I get to preach on this topic quite a bit. Uh, what worries me is the things that are being presented in the textbooks have been proven to be false. Some of them for over 100 years. Yet they're still being uh, taught in our textbooks today. Today I'm going to try and bring some of those up. I think this is the lie of the end times. Basically, the scoffers, the Bible says, are ignorant of three things, the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment of God. Uh, and this poison is being taught right alongside of science in our textbooks. It's being portrayed as science, but as Ken has already said, it's not science at all. The things are being taught that we came from a micro dot. It's just incredible, but there's no science behind it. Many of these claims that are being taught every day have no scientific evidence. There's nothing behind it whatsoever. I'm afraid that when you're being taught that you're an animal and you share a common heritage with earthworms, that the end product will be you'll end up like this. And you don't have to live like this. God created everybody in his image. He created you in his image, and he's got a wonderful future for you. Adolf Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, the people will believe it. He also said people are more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. I believe evolution is that big lie and it's led a lot of people astray, and it's definitely been detrimental to science. God gave man a mind for science to draw man to him, and that's what's happened in my case, and I hope to represent that side today. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out today. Uh, my name is Nick Power. I'm teaching a philosophy program here at UWF. I'm not a biologist, and I'm certainly not a theologian, so, uh, all I hope to do today is give you some reasonable grounds uh, on, upon which you can make a decision, uh, if you need to make a decision, about this issue. But I should say, uh, uh, by way of introductory comments, um, this debate is kind of unfortunate, right? I mean, this debate needn't be, in this room needn't be, but the broader cultural debate is very unfortunate, it's very divisive, and it's being fought out in school classrooms and boards of education all over the country and uh, that's uh, at least divisive and unproductive. Um, that's not where it ought to be uh, fought out. But uh, it's being fought out there for a deeper reason, I think. 
And uh, that's because I believe um, our guests today here uh, are threatening a Christian worldview much more than Darwin or Hume or any uh, secular humanist ever did. That's because if they are right, if they're on the right track, then Genesis and the account of Genesis has to come over onto scientific terms and go into a lab and uh, stand head to toe to the National Science Foundation and all the universities and all the research institutes around the world who are um, exploring and making progress in evolutionary terms and in evolutionary theory and refining that theory, uh, Genesis has to stand up to all those guys and girls. And I think you lose. I think that debate, if they're on the right track, is a losing one. So if I was a Christian in this room, I would be on my side, uh, particularly on Terry's side, and believe in theistic evolution, right? Uh, just so you understand, theistic evolution is the view that um, it's a, a version of theism, and theism just says that uh, some divine power is required to, some supernatural force or divine power is required to get this business we call the universe rolling. But he um, needn't have done it in some uh, account as presented in Genesis, and uh, uh, certainly needn't to have made whole species out of cloth, or you and I out of mud, and then blown a wind over us. No, he's much more subtle processes and a much more su supple supernatural force than that. And uh, that's what I recommend to you all. Um, uh, those Christians in the room, I recommend uh, theistic evolution and not creation science. Thank you. Uh, welcome Genesis to go into the laboratory and be tested. I'd like to see any scientific evidence that discredits anything told in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis tells us all the animals are going to bring forth after their kind. I think we've had thousands of years of breeding experience that has proven that to be exactly correct. Dogs produce dogs and you know, cats produce cats. Nothing has, nothing, there is nothing in Genesis that can't stand all the scientific scrutiny you want to give it. As far as from the philosophy end, let me tell you how this all started. Back in the early 1800s, the geologic column was invented. <clears throat> By the way, the geologic column is a hoax. It does not exist any place in the world except in the textbooks. The geologic column teaches that each of these layers of rock strata that we see are millions of years different in age. This kind of set the stage for people to begin to doubt the Bible in the early 1800s. We have ample evidence that those rock layers are not different ages. There are polystrata fossils, rocks running up through multiple layers. These rock petrified trees standing straight up are very common. They're found all over the world. I've seen dozens of them. The petrified trees in the vertical position indicate the rock layers are not different ages. I don't know how many states they've been found in, but quite a few places where they have coal, they find these polystrata fossils. But this geologic column is what convinced Darwin that the Earth was millions of years old. As Darwin sailed around the uh, world in 1831, let me get here a second. As Darwin sailed around, he began to read a book by Charles Lyell that had been published in 1830. Darwin graduated from Bible college to be a preacher at age 22. When he got this job to sail around on the Beagle, he wasn't paid anything. He couldn't find a paying job. His dad or somebody helped him get this job on the Beagle. He was not a scientist. He was a preacher. But as he sailed around, he read the book by Charles Lyell, and that book changed his life forever. He began to have serious doubts about the Bible. Later in life, Darwin said, Disbelief crept over me slowly. I felt no distress. And many Christians go to universities and slowly begin to disbelieve the Bible. Not because there's any scientific evidence given against it. I think it's mostly because of peer pressure or the mocking that some people do. They mock God's word. Uh, I would say the theistic evolution position would certainly not be at all what I would take. Uh, a God that has to use suffering, misfits, death, a God that doesn't know what he wants first time and can't make it right in six days like he said, that's a retarded God. I would not worship that one at all. Certainly not the God of the Bible. As Darwin sailed around, he came to the Galapagos Islands. Here on the Galapagos Islands, Charlie noticed there were 14 varieties of finches. And right here is where the whole problem, I think, comes to a head. Darwin observed these varieties of birds, and he concluded probably all these birds have a common ancestor. I bet you're right, Charlie, and it was a bird. <laughs> and then he concluded, we can draw this another step and say this proves the birds and the bananas are related. Ooh, and I would disagree with that. One person said, oh, Charlie never said the birds and the bananas are related. Oh, well, sort of. In his book on page 170, Charles Darwin said, it is a truly wonderful fact that all animals and all plants throughout all time and space should be related to each other. 
It looks to me like he's saying the birds and the bananas are related. Charlie observed what we call microevolution. <clears throat> dogs producing a variety of dogs. Birds producing a variety of birds. That's a fact, folks. That happens. Nobody argues with that. Microevolution is certainly true. And I would not argue with that for a second. The whole problem, I think, in universities and across the world with this evolution creation controversy, the whole problem is the definition of that word evolution. I think students are being deceived because one definition of, the, um, of microevolution certainly is scientific. Dogs produce dogs. You might get a big dog or a little dog, and they probably had a common ancestor. It could be the dog, the wolf, and the coyote are related. I wouldn't argue about that. But a three-year-old will tell you it's the same kind of animal. Let's put a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana on the table. Okay, boys and girls, which one is not like the others? <laughs> well, a three-year-old knows it's the banana. Okay, it could be that the horse and the zebra came from a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But stand 30 feet away and look at them. You're talking about the same kind of animal. That's not evolution. The Bible says the animals will bring forth after their kind. That's all that's been observed. See, the problem is this word evolution. There is cosmic evolution. That's the Big Bang. There's no evidence for that whatsoever. There's chemical evolution. How do you get from hydrogen, which the Big Bang produced, hydrogen and helium, how do you get to the higher elements? Hmm? How did that happen? How do you get stellar and planetary evolution? Nobody's ever seen a star form. Some people say, well, we think there's one forming in Crab Nebulae. Well, we haven't seen one yet. There's organic evolution, the origin of life. Nobody's ever seen that. Macroevolution, changing from one kind to another. Nobody's ever seen that. And then we have microevolution, which certainly does happen. The first five are religious. They are not scientific. And I resent my tax dollars confusing the kids into thinking all of those are related. They're all the same. They are not the same. Um. I want to really respond to several things. Uh, the, the first thing is that the individuals who are responsible for creation science are the second generation of people who follow the writers of the fundamentals. The fundamentals being a series of tracts that were written between around 1914 and, and 1919 uh, by conservative Christians who were alarmed with the success of uh, biologists in essentially selling the evolutionary model to the Christian community. Over and over and over, uh, people were experiencing the evidence and deciding that the Earth was much older than Genesis said it was, and that other facts uh, presented, or, or statements presented in Genesis were not factual, or were not factual in the sense that people had thought they were factual. As it turns out, uh, it is clear that Genesis is merely one of many kinds of creation stories and origin myths which has been presented over the eons by different groups of people. It happens to be the one that has been foundational to much of our culture. And so these Christians, people of very good conscience, wrote the fundamentals. Almost to a person, the people who wrote the fundamentals believed in an earth older than the earth that Kent Hovind believes in. And most of them were, uh, they were either gap theorists or they were, uh, they were, they were individuals who uh, very well educated, very conservative Christians who uh, were in effect uh, creationists, but they were the beginnings of uh, sort of a, a line drawn in the sand said theistic uh, evolution uh, is as far as we're going to go. Um, it was the second generation of people following the fundamentals who, picking up on a couple of individual preachers, decided that Genesis had to be literally true and inerrant. Now, you challenge uh, to show a, a falsehood in Genesis. Uh, there are many that we could look at. Uh, I would like to point out one. Uh, I don't know, what, the, what, the, what is the length of a cubit that you have, Kent? Uh, uh, but 20.6 uh, uh, what? In inches, so a little over a, a foot and a half, all right? Uh, the, in fact, the ark then would be some 450 feet long. As it turns out, uh, physics and modern science empirically uh, realized at the end of the, uh, the middle of the last century that the biggest wooden ship that can be built is only about 300 feet long. Anything bigger than that had to be seriously girded with iron, and the, the boats tended to be very unstable in the water, they tended to sag in the middle or rise in the middle and the ends would sag. They tended to leak like sieves. 
and they tended to be very unseaworthy, and so they quit making them. And in fact, one of the things that caused us to go over to steamships was the complete instability of sailing ships uh, or, or other kinds of wooden ships, wooden structures made for water over 300 feet length. So in addition to making the ark, Noah has to depend upon the miracle of God to keep it from sinking. In addition, the ark would have displaced by the accounts, by the accounts of some of the creationists, it would have displaced enough water that the account of how much water over the tops of the mountains in a worldwide flood would be such that it would have run aground on the highest mountains. Not, not that it necessarily would have gone there, but it could have run aground. So uh, certainly it is a slipshod approach to uh, uh, destroying and uh, recreating the world to, uh, to do uh, the destruction and to manage the creation in human terms in such a way that it could have failed so easily. Uh, I'll add one other thing. How have I got? 60 seconds. Well, we'll do this uh, another time. Let me point out that all philosophers in the 19th century were trained in metaphysics, that is, first principles, in natural philosophy, in theology, in social philosophy, at the, at the minimum, as well as in uh, ethics and, and, uh, uh, and aesthetics, the basic systems of philosophy. For Darwin to have been trained in theology is a, absolutely not a surprise. Everybody was. Don't you think it's curious that Darwin, Hume, and so many other scientists, great thinkers of the greatest century of the modern era, the 19th century, should come up with evolution reading God's natural text, the world. Thank you, sir. Mike, you have five minutes. No, it has been discovered, and it was not discovered in 1978, and the Turkish government has it, built a visitor center for it and a road to it. You can watch them dig it up today if you like. I'd love to show pictures of it at the end of the uh, show if you'll let me. The discussion's not about Genesis, it's about proving evolution. We're attacking and they're defending. Also, uh, I don't see that um, uh, a God who would use, I don't think God would use evolution. It's not the clear teaching of scripture. You, you would not be able to read the Bible and come away with evolution unless you came to it with that preconceived ideal from a public education. I don't believe God is, uh, is cruel. He doesn't need misfits and mutations to make everything. He can make it right the first time. I think there's many indications just in nature he's given us where bees need flowers and such. Um, another remark was basically, I guess, I guess I lost my thing there, but that's okay. We'll do what we can here to get it going. Um, the first generation was not alarmed. They were basically just uh, saying there's no evidence for this. Uh, that's what we're saying today. We're still here today defending that there's no evidence uh, for evolution. Well, technology is great until it crashes, but here we go. We got it again. Let's bring up some lies that are taught in the textbooks today as truth. And the opposite of truth, in fact, is basically a lie. They're teaching today that... Um, uh, we have uh, vestigial organs, and that is proof for evolution. I don't know how you can put one and one together and come up with that uh, as, as your um, equivalent, but that's just not true. Medical science has proven a use for just about every organ I have ever heard was used for evolution. Uh, many things are being taught today, like whales used to walk around on land because uh, they have a vestigial pelvis. Uh, I'm sorry, that whale needs that uh, pelvis just to reproduce. Some very special muscles anchor onto that. That's not a pelvis, the whale needs it. It has nothing to do with evolution whatsoever, yet these things are being taught as fact. We're taught our tailbones are vestigial. Uh, we will pay at CSE to have anybody's tailbone removed to make this point. You need that tailbone, some very special muscles anchor to it that you will need in about a day. These things are not proof for evolution, yet they're still in our textbooks. Uh, even if there were some vestigial organs, that would be the opposite of evolution. These lies are mixed in with science, and we love science at creation science evangelism. We know real science, like these lights and computers, will draw you to God. But there are po there's a poison mixed in. Uh, right now, today, I probably would not find, uh, ha have a hard time finding this in probably a biology textbook from this campus. Uh, Haeckel's drawings of a baby going through supposedly all the four, uh, steps of evolution before it becomes human. Well, this was proven to be a lie almost 100 years ago. Haeckel was convicted of fraud at his university, University of Jena. I guess that slide's not going to come up today. Uh, all the supposed evidence they have, fossil evidence for the cavemen, those have all been thrown out. 
not just by the creationists, but by, by the evolutionists themselves. It doesn't matter. Uh, look at um, the caveman, Neanderthal, built up from a pig's tooth. Uh, Piltdown man, uh, built up, it was a fraud. Convi uh, th these people were shown to be frauds. It was a human skull and an ape's jawbone. Uh, for 40 years, that was in our textbooks, leading students astray as divine, uh, supreme proof for evolution. I wonder how many kids doubted the Bible because of this and died and went to hell because of this lie. It certainly was not a fact. It certainly was not proved at that point, And it certainly still is in many textbooks across the country as proof for evolution when it's been proven wrong. Uh, Neanderthal man, that was a man with arthritis. They saw the skeleton. It was bent over. They said he's halfway going. He's halfway from ape walking on fours to a man walking on twos. It was an old man with arthritis. He was halfway going down. These things are, are ridiculous, but they're still in textbooks today. Lucy, the problems are incredible with Lucy. The remains are from different animals, remains found scattered over miles at different depths, and that's even if you believe in the geologic column. Lucy's knees were not her own. There was nothing below the hips, yet they put feet, human feet, on uh, the displays and in the pictures in the textbooks and at zoos. Uh, Donald Johansson claimed that this angled femur proved that uh, she was evolving. All tree-dwelling monkeys have an angled femur so they can get a better grip on the limb they're on. And he said, well, after that, well, the bigger bones proves it's evolving. No, it just means it's a bigger animal. Uh, you don't, would not look at a Clydesdale horse and think it's turning into a Mack truck because it's heavy boned. And Lucy is a modern chimp, alive and well in Sumatra. And just number seven alone, I think, is good proof for a divine creator made right the first time. There's an article showing right there, Lucy's alive and well in Sumatra. Creation Ex Nihilo magazine, March through May, 1996, page eight. If you want to read more on this, just get Marvin Lumenau's book, Bones of Contention. Folks, there's a lot of things being pushed as truth and fact that are not and have been proven wrong for many years now. And we're not alarmed uh, at evolution. We're alarmed that so many lies are being used to push it. Thank you, Mike. Nick, five minutes. Thanks. Uh, well, again, I'm not a biologist, right? And I'd recommend um, that we uh, hold off and until we get some education in biology to um, evaluate some of the claims being made up here today. Uh, I think it's very hard for you or I to um, make sense of these complicated claims about vestigial organs and all the rest of it. Let's try to uh, abstract away from this and think about the bigger picture. Uh, why should you believe in a... Uh, natural selection and evolution via uh, processes described by Darwin or Neo-Darwinians. Neo -Darwin well, uh, you, I mean, not a, not a biologist or a, a student of biology, but uh, you yourself. I know what evidence they have, and if they didn't believe it, they ought not be biologists, but why should you believe it? Um, well, first let me tell you why you sh I don't think you should believe it, right? And we'll go through a few of those, and I think in the next session, I'll tell you maybe why you should. Um, you shouldn't believe it then uh, because it's true, right? Um, truth is too heavy a word, better left for the theologians or philosophers, right? There's very, various theories of truth and um, truth is one and all these, it's too heavy a term, right? I wouldn't expect you to believe um, a theory uh, because I told you it was true or even that it was demonstrably true, right? That I could prove it to you. I really sincerely doubt that any of those biology textbooks uh, say that they have proof for a theory in biology, right? Scientists don't talk that way. They don't talk about demonstrative proof. That's a logical term, right? Better left for the logicians. Um, uh, what we're talking about here is confirming a theory, right? And theories get better and better confirmed. They don't get proven. So our offering $250 million or something for proof of evolutionary theory is a sophism, right? Um, maybe you should believe it because uh, it's empirically adequate, right? Because it describes all the facts um, of the natural world. I don't think so, right? Lots of theories could do that. Even an account like Genesis could explain everything and describe in different words, model, that is, all the natural processes that you, you will observe in your life. But we're, we have very limited access to the universe, right? We haven't seen it all. We don't know what all the facts there are to be described. And this theory may not be empirically adequate, right? Uh, Darwin himself admitted to huge gaps in his theory, 
and we've just added a major refinement to that theory in 1953 when we figured out that the code of life, right, DNA, the digital code by which micro and macro, if you're going to admit microevolution, I think you have to admit macro, uh, given if, if micro happens according to mechanisms um, uh, at the genetic level, but we'll get back to that, I digress. Um, no, it, I don't think just because a theory describes all the facts, you should believe it. A simple vacuous theory, right, uh, could do that. Um, maybe you should believe neo-Darwinian evolution through natural selection because it's simpler. But I think for most of you, most of the people in this room, uh, Genesis is simpler, right? So um, I don't think that's going to get us very far. And the same with aesthetically beautiful and pleasant. I mean, uh, perhaps for a biologist like Dr. Gould up there or um, other biologists, they can see the simplicity and the elegance in neo-Darwinian evolution. But I can't, frankly. It, science is hard, right? Um, myths are easy, and they're meant to simplify. Uh, maybe you should believe it, because as, as I said before, the, the vast majority of informed and reasonable professional people do, right? Maybe you should believe it because all of the scientific boards and all of the people who we trust, right, to cure our diseases and to inquire into the natural world, maybe you should believe it because they do. But no, you shouldn't, right? That's another bad reason to believe it. Um, just like I'm not going to tell you what to believe based on authority, neither should uh, my opponents, right? You should, um, uh, those scientists, don't give you a reason why you should believe it, right? You have to figure it out for yourself. And that's, sorry, a harder task, but uh, you have to be the one to evaluate the evidence. And I think when you do that, the reasonable conclusion is that the wor world is more than six to 10,000 years old, and life forms have evolved from simpler ones through mechanisms involving DNA. Cheers. in which each of the participants have three minutes to respond, uh, I assume, uh, extemporaneously to what they've heard over the last several minutes. So Kent, take it away, three minutes. All right, well, I appreciate that. Uh, I want you to notice throughout this discussion today, um, uh, Mr. Powers has referred a few times to Genesis being simpler. I think there's a subtle connotation in here, like if you believe that, you're dumb, scientists know the be no, they know better, you know, it's kind of the I'm smart, you're dumb philosophy, I mean, any philosopher should know that's uh, it's not good logic, okay, and to, to say Genesis is simpler, here you are saying that, you know, I believe it is pretty simple, it's written, and I believe it's exactly the way it happened, uh, and I, I don't think you have to be stupid to believe that, I got an IQ of about 160 and taught science 15 years and debate on this topic all the time, there simply is no evidence for evolution. I think it's simple to see dogs produce a variety of dogs. And to assume that this proves, that micro proves macro, which is what he said, I disagree 100%. It takes a giant leap of faith and logic to go from micro to macro. Nobody's ever seen a dog produce a non-dog. What we have here is a classic case of bait and switch. If I said, boys and girls, I got a new Mercedes for $10, people would line up for 10 miles down the street to get that thing. And when they got there, I'd say, well, we just sold it. How about look at this one? It's only 99000 Bait and switch is illegal, folks. People get thrown in jail for that, for advertising. False advertising. And yet your textbooks at this university give the kids a classic case of bait and switch. They give them a definition for evolution, like descent with modification. This 1999 edition textbook that I just reviewed last week for the school system says evolution means a change over time. That's not really what they mean. Here it says evolution is defined as a change in species over time. This is deceitful. What happens is they get the kids to believing in evolution with this definition, which is true. But then they switch them. They slip in the real meaning like cosmic evolution, big bang, organic evolution, the other five that I mentioned, for which there is no evidence whatsoever. I, I come from Illinois, corn country. There's all sorts of corn up there, folks. And you can crossbreed your corn. They have to number them. There's so many different varieties of corn, they name them and number them. But you're never going to get a hamster or a tomato or a whale to grow on that corn stalk, okay? You're going to get corn. See, variations happen. You get a variety of dogs, a variety of cows. Variations happen, but they have limits. And somehow the evolutionist either doesn't see this or doesn't understand it or doesn't want to admit it. But yes, we have varieties, but there are limits. Farmers try to breed for bigger pigs, don't they? Do you think they'll ever get a pig as big as Texas? 
No, there's a limit in there someplace. And the limit is what Genesis said they would be after their kind. Roaches become resistant to pesticides after a while. They do. But they never become resistant to a sledgehammer. There's a limit to the resistance. And I don't know how somebody can believe we all came from a rock over 4.6 billion years. Evolution doesn't happen. Variations happen, but they're the same kind of animal. You might get a big dog or a little dog, but that's not evolution. It's just a variety. And the gene pool already contained that information. Gene pool is much more limited of the new variety. That's not evolution. And genetic information is lost with all these changes. Nothing is gained. And people like Niles Eldridge will admit there is no evidence for this theory. We'll get into that next time. Again, a three-minute rebuttal, Dr. Pruitt. I, I want to start by saying that Darwin was not accepted at first, and uh, in fact, Darwinian evolution is not accepted today in its totality. Uh, we fight with each other over the data and over theories. Uh, if you talk to two evolutionists, one will be a proponent of punctuated equilibrium, and another will be a proponent of gradualism. And all of these things are things that I'm not going to deal with until my next data section. But uh, we are talking about Genesis here, because ultimately the text that creation science uses as its basic check to see whether things are right is Genesis. Now, all texts require interpretation. Let's consider the story of Joseph. When jo uh, not, uh, not, let's not consider the story of Joseph. Let's go to uh, Jacob. Uh, when he's living with Laban and he's taking care of his, his flocks. Now, you can choose to interpret what Jacob did to get one kind of, of animals on one side and another kind of animals on the other, and ultimately he ended up with all the flocks because he got all the striped ones or the spotted ones. You can interpret what he did as microevolutionary knowledge, which is one way of looking at it, or you can interpret what he did as magic. And in fact, Genesis implies that what he was doing was magic. Uh, because in fact, before we had a, a knowledge of genetics, all of the stuff that we did that worked like that was magic. Uh, in, in effect, scientists are great magicians. Uh, the point that I'm making is that the text of Genesis is the foundation of creation science, not the record. And I could contend and refute every single contention that's been made against the fossil record, against uh, the material record that has been made by my colleagues. If we have enough time, we can take the time and do it. I can refute every single claim about Neanderthal, about Lucy. I, wouldn't, I don't care about, so much about Lucy's, Lucy's knees. I thought her hips were pretty impressive. All right? And in fact, half-truths is what you're hearing from the other side. Half-truths. We tell the part of it that fits our argument, we leave out the part that doesn't fit. And that is something that's not allowed in the rules of science. The rules of science say to us, you look at the world, and however the world comes to you, that's what you've got to contend with. And if, and if nature comes back and says no, if you're a theistic evolutionist, then you're saying God is coming back and saying no. You haven't solved it yet. You're not supposed to have that perfect knowledge. I'll finish this by saying Kenneth Pike, who was a very devoted Christian and supporter, he was one of the founders of the Wycliffe Bible Translator Group, said that the perfect epistemology would be the epistemology of God, that knowledge of what happens in its detail, in perfection. I'm not perfect. I'm a human. I have to deal with science. Here we go. Technology's working. I love science. <laughs> okay. Well... I still contend I don't believe in the theistic evolution. I don't believe in any form of evolution, especially that we came from a rock. There's no, absolutely no genetic material in a rock, and that presents kind of a problem for uh, theistic evolution unless you're looking for a miracle. But I will go back to what's being taught in our textbooks as truth and fact, and that is horse evolution. You'll even see it at the zoos. Horse evolution is supposed to be uh, the end all beat all to prove that horses evolved, yet uh, that's not what they're teaching the kids in school. They're teaching the kids some crazy things. Uh, like these horses are evolving, but the truth is they won't tell them that it starts out with the Eohippus with 18 pairs of ribs, then you keep going on to the next generation, and they just can't make up how many ribs they're supposed to have. There's a lot of problems with this horse evolution. It was made up 
by Othniel C. Marsh in 1874 from fossils scattered across the world and not from the same location, which was Lucy's problem, scattered over, over almost two miles at different depths. Modern horses are found in layers with and lower than ancient horses. If you believe in the geologic column, that presents a problem for your theories. Uh, the ancient horse is not a horse, but is just like any, the hyrax still alive today. I've seen one in a zoo before. Ribs, toes, teeth, everything is totally different. Uh, South American fossils go from one to two, uh, one toed to three toed, and they're never found in the order presented. Othniel just put them together like he thought he should, they should go. And it's all being taught as fact and peddling to push evolution as true. And once you start to fall for this lie of evolution that has no evidence for it, uh, scientific evidence, stuff that you can measure, taste, touch, weigh, and smell, and all that, uh, once you begin to fall for that, you're going to have a hard time with the Bible. They're pushing that uh, dinosaurs uh, uh, evolved into birds. I just read an article on this uh, in a magazine here about a month ago. They're bringing it back again, using the Archaeopteryx argument all over again. Yet they're not teaching the kids it was proven to be a lie. And what good is half an arm and half a wing for millions of years? You just can't catch that dragonfly either way. The problems with Archaeopteryx was, well, the feather imprints were shown to be a fraud in 1990, and this hoax is still being used in public school textbooks, in the newspapers, on Discovery Channel. Because of the fake feathers, the slab halves of both halves of this fossil don't even line up anymore. Two real birds have been found that predate Archaeopteryx. Again, if you believe in the geologic column, that pre presents quite a problem. They say the wishbone was, uh, ch there was a hole chiseled out for the wishbone and it was put in backwards and upside down. Folks, there's a lot of problems with that that they're presenting. They're not presenting the whole truth about these fossils. It's considered to be the little compy dinosaur that people saw in Jurassic Park, the sequel. And the feather imprints are only found in two of the six fossils, and these have been proven to be faked. Somebody slaps the cement, some cement on one of these halves and uh, imprinted feathers in it, is what uh, our side's claiming. There's not enough fossil records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens emerged. This is from an evolutionist. Apart from very modern examples, I'm sorry, I have to stop here. Thank you. Again, I'm not a biologist. Um, and again, I'm not a theologian. I think all I can rely on, right, and recommend to you all, is that you take in these facts and half-truths. Some facts, the fossil record is incomplete. Some half-truths that, um, oh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, I just hope that you're taking this in using your full critical reflective capacities, you know, that evolution through natural selection gave you. Uh, that is, I, I hope that you haven't lost sense of the discussion here before us today, right? Um, why should you believe this theory as opposed to it, an account based on Genesis? We're talking about your adopting or revising a belief. This evidence might be impressive if we knew how to evaluate it, but unless you know what, again, what vestigial or organs are, and what Archaeopteryx is, and how gradual changes from a dinosaur into a bird, if that doesn't even make sense to you, you see, you can evaluate the claim that that's what in fact happened, right? You don't have a leg to stand upon. Unless you can have some, you know, reasonably informed and critical capacities to evaluate that claim, it's neither here nor there. I can't, you know, I've read Richard Dawkins' book, Rivers Out of Eden, I recommend it to all of you. It's got a beautiful discussion of how um, a, a, a capacity such as the, the eye or vision or um, a wing can evolve out of, um, from nowhere, so to speak, by, by a miracle. Um, I've, I fully recommend that book to you as an account of how that process can actually happen. But until we've got, read, got that book behind us, we cannot evaluate these claims and many of these other claims. In my next non-rebuttal phase, I'll tell you why you should believe in uh, evolution through uh, natural selection. Okay? Promise. Okay, well, we are to that section. It's uh, the data section. Ken Hoven, you have five minutes to present your material. Well, my seminar is 15 hours long, so we're going to have to really rush here, aren't we? Uh, I certainly, <clears throat> I will have to say right up front, I resent both of these gentlemen saying we're presenting half-truths. I would like you to be very specific. Pick on one, please, and show me. And also, you keep saying there's evidence for evolution. I'd like you to be very specific. Give me your best shot. Give me the first best evidence you've got. I really would like to see it. 
I'm telling you there is no evidence whatsoever for any evolution above the, um, above the micro evolution level. <clears throat> And again, I resent, and I think you should resent, the implication here that uh, unless you have the critical thinking skills to evaluate the data, you really should get some more education. In other words, uh, somebody else is smart. The people who believe in evolution are smart. The people who don't believe it are dumb. Uh, to me, that's what's coming across loud and clear. Okay, one of the evidences used for evolution, and I taught biology and earth science for 15 years, one of the evidences that's in every textbook I have seen is the fruit flies. They're going to say they did experiments with the fruit flies since you get a new generation every 11 days. They can prove evolution of uh, millions of years compacted into one human lifespan. After nuking and radiating and microwaving these flies and getting them to cause all sorts of mutated babies, they got flies with curled wings. They'd fly around, bzz, 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 couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings. That's a crawl, not a fly. They raised all sorts of mutated flies. They never got a beneficial mutation. None of the millions of flies that were raised in laboratories ever showed any improvement. Everyone was detrimental. But somehow, in their twisted logic, these guys who did this experiment said, you know what, all the mutations we observed were worse off. Now that's a good observation, and I would agree with that. But then they concluded, this proves flies have evolved as far as they can go. Now that's a lousy conclusion to reach from the data. What you should conclude is, God made them right the first time. Thousands of textbooks. I have reviewed literally hundreds and hundreds of textbooks. I have several hundred in my library. You can ask my folks that work for me in my ministry, but nearly everyone I'm aware of uses the peppered moth as evidence for evolution. They counted the moths on the trees and found out they were 95% light and 5% black. In the areas where they were burning coal in the factories, the trees turned black, and so they claimed they were 5% white and 95% black. Turned out later the experiment was a complete fraud. Only two moths, exactly two moths in 40 years, were ever seen resting on trees. They had to glue the moths to the tree and glue a dead stuffed bird to the tree to take the picture as evidence for the theory. The whole thing has been discredited. It is still in textbooks now, though. The purpose of this discussion today is to show what evidence do we have for evolution. What Mike and I, I think, are trying to do, instead of going off in the philosophical realm, we're trying to say, look, there is no evidence. Everything they're telling you that is evidence is not evidence. It's false. The moth evolution is not evidence for evolution. But the students are taught this in every textbook I'm aware of. Actually, it's evidence for design. Then they have the gall to tell the students to think critically with a question like this. Do you think humans are still evolving? That's one of those loaded questions like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> There's no way for a kid to answer that question. The question assumes evolution happened. This is not teaching them how to think. This is teaching them what to think. That's a Soviet-style indoctrination type question. The textbooks are going to say, we've got evidence from structure. They're going to say it's called the homology argument, the two bones in the wrist, the radius and the ulna of all the different animals. And that's supposed to be evidence for evolution. This textbook says comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution, which is what the debate is supposed to be about. The commonality suggests these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. Now hold on just a second. If you see some similarities in different forelimb structures of different animals, that does not prove they had a common ancestor. It might prove they have a common designer. The same guy built them all. That's why they're similar. Why aren't students told, hey, there's several ways to look at this? I mean, do students come to the University of West Florida to get educated or to get indoctrinated? See, indoctrination only shows one side. My son right now and his wife are speaking in Ukraine. He's been over there for three weeks. I've spoken over there before. In Ukrainian schools, former Soviet Republic, all the students ever see is one side. When I spoke over there to 30 professors at the university in Chernovsky, one of the professors was crying. I asked the interpreter, I said, what's he crying about? And she said, he's never heard the creation story. He didn't know there was one. He wants you to keep going. He wants to hear more about this. And the students at the University of West Florida need to see both sides. The evidence for evolution is defunct. There's none. Terry, you have five minutes to present your material on data. It's on again. Am I on? I'm on. Uh, I'm not going to respond to the ad hominem, and therefore uh, I'll go on with some evidence. First of all, the theory of evolution is dependent. The synthetic theory of evolution, which is what we pursue today, 
is dependent upon four primary premises. Um, these are the principles through which evolution works. They're natural selection, isolation, mutation, uh, and, uh, and I've forgotten the other one. <laughs> Well, see, that's, that's what education will do for you. You just forget. I'm getting old. That's the problem. Um, isolation, mutation, selection, and drift. Uh, I'm not going to explain those to you because it would take my whole five minutes. What I will tell you is that natural selection was the ground point that Darwin and, and Wallace both came up with independently, looking at the same world on opposite sides of the world looking at the diversity of the species and saying that somehow the characteristics being passed from one generation to another were being selected for. They didn't know the mechanism. That was left to the work of Gregor Mendel, a monk working in Russia in the 19th century, and his work was uncovered in the 1920s and uh, began the study of genetics which gave us the study of population genetics. And, and genetics led to Watson and Crick's uh, discovery of the structure of deoxyribonucleic acid and the functions of deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid in protein synthesis, the basis of all life. The very same chemical structures in us are in the pine trees outside. And they operate to create the diverse proteins, the diverse biological characteristics and qualities which give us our specific characteristics. Through time, one of the ways that mutation works is that chemical switches start and stop in uh, different processes. An enzyme switch in the genetic material itself determines the shape of your molars and the number of cusps. And we know that we share cusp patterns with gorillas, for example. All of you in this room uh, have the potential of having Y5 cusp on your wisdom teeth if you have them. Many of you don't even have wisdom teeth. Uh, some of you who do have wisdom teeth have cusp patterns that are identical to gorillas' teeth. That doesn't prove anything. And I, you know, I, I think Kent's argument that one designer could produce similar designs. God knows Detroit has done the same thing. You can put different labels on it. But uh, the fact is that if you look at the full record, and I think Nick made this point a little more subtly than it should have been made, so I'm going to try to do it a little more resoundingly. If you look at the full record of biology, at the advances of the 20th century, at the Human Genome Project, at the processes of inoculation, at the medical knowledge that we have in this century, all of which are founded on the very same empirical generalizations as the interpretation of what I have called God's text, the natural world, which is evolution as a theory, then those data don't, uh, individual, individual data may stand or fall. We may show, and it's a common technique of my opponents, to pull out one or another uh, example of something which didn't uh, work out. And in some, and Piltdown, I'm really tired of hearing about Piltdown. It was anthropologists who exposed Piltdown in the textbooks. There's not a single contemporary textbook that teaches Piltdown except to tell that it was a hoax by an over-exuberant, over-zealous, uh, really, um, person who was looking for a lot of kudos. Uh, science works through anonymous, quiet work. Most people don't even remember one of the discoverers of deoxyribonucleic acid, partly because she was a woman and partly because she died before they gave the Nobel Prize. So Watson and Crick and her partner, you know, got the prize. Uh, the fact is, that evolution is the best interpretation of the natural record we have before us of biology, of human, of you know, process, biological process, and of the geologic record. Now my time's up. Mike, your turn. Thank you, sir. 
Well, we named a few similarities between men and ape, but the differences are just astronomical. Hair, hands, feet, etc. Uh, and as far as just picking on one of the cavemen, what about Piltdown, Neanderthal, and Lucy? I mean, just, it's been discredited. There's just nothing there. Let's talk about what the evolutionists themselves think of evolution. They all prove each other's theories and totally impossible. I, I call that having not a leg to stand on myself. Each theory I know of proves all the others just totally impossible. There's no legs to hold that table up. How about these family trees that we see in our textbooks today? Those are certainly still in textbooks today. Well, Mary Leakey, and she's a very big time evolutionist, says all those trees of life with their branches of our ancestors, that's a lot of nonsense. Why is that on our textbook if it's a bunch of nonsense? Uh, Stephen Jay Gold, I don't know of too many bigger uh, evolutionists except for the ones I'm going to use some quotes from here, uh, said this, the evolutionary trees that adorn our textbooks have data only at the tips and nodes of their branches. That means what's alive today, folks. The rest is inference, however reasonable, not the evidence of fossils. These are lies that are being taught as fact, and we're not using half-truths. They've got to deal with what I'm saying today. They say these single-cell organisms are simple. Uh, smaller is much more complex. Look at the microchip in a computer, that's very complex. The paramecium is single cell, but it's not simple. It's 100 times more complex than the space shuttle. And the space shuttle is the most complex thing I've, I know of on the face of the planet. See, the probability of just one DNA arranging itself by chance has been calculated to be one chance in 10 to the 119,000th power. That's a big number. That's a very big number. There's only room in the entire universe for, for two times 10 to the 81st uh, power electrons. I don't think there's much chance of that happening. And similar DNA codes can also prove the same design engineer wrote the codes. It does not prove evolution. There are two sides to look, there's two sides to look at here. Uh, this is what uh, 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 Harrison Matthews said, uh, the fact of evolution is the backbone of biology. And biology is thus in the pe peculiar position of being a science founded on an unproved theory. Is this science or a faith? Evolution is just a very bad religion. I know that at least in uh, paleoanthropology, data are still so sparse that theory heavily, heavily influences interpretations. Theories have, in the past, clearly reflected our current ideologies instead of the actual data. And ideologies and uh, what people want to believe is what's being pushed in our science textbooks today. Uh, this is Dr. Colin Patterson, what he says. He went around asking, can you tell me anything you know about evolution? Any one thing, any one thing that is true? He directed this question to the members of the Evolutionary Morphology Seminar, University of Chicago. The reply, one person stood up and said, I do know one thing, it ought not to be taught in high school. And I agree, it is not science, it is not fact. He even went further replying to a letter one day, I fully agree with you on your comments on the lack of evolutionary transitions in my book, if I knew of any fossil or living, I've never seen a living fossil, I would certainly included them. I will lay it on the line, there is not one such fossil. How come it's being used in our textbooks today as evidence for evolution? Why are Christians being made to feel like the minority? And uh, it's just ridiculous, folks. David, uh, David Rupp says in the years after Darwin, his advocates hoped to find predictable progressions in general. These have not been found. Yet the optimism has died hard and some pure fantasy has crept into our textbooks. Evolutionists are saying this. This is not the creationist point of view. There are no missing links. The whole chain is missing. That's not what's being taught in the textbooks right there. The whole chain is missing. Absence of fossil evidence for intermediary stages has been a, na a persistent and nagging problem for evolution. I'll say so. Stephen Gould said that. Big time evolutionist. That's what they're saying, folks. I myself am convinced that the theory of evolution, especially to the extent to which it has been taught, uh, applied, I'm sorry, will be one of the great jokes in the history books of the future. Uh, I believe we're seeing that now. Scientists are now distancing, many scientists are now distancing themselves from evolution. Scientists who go about teaching that evolution is a fact of life are great con men. Folks, I'm just reading here quotes from what evolutionists say. Dr. Arthur Keith, evolution is unproved and unprovable. We believe it only because the only alternative is special creation, and that is unthinkable. And that is unthinkable to the anthropologist, I, I see. I guess it's un uh, unthinkable to many of the scholars these days. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. This theory has helped nothing in the progress of science. It is useless. This has held back science for hundreds of years. It's just what happened to George Washington. He was sick. They taught the doctrine of humors back in his day. If you're sick, you've got bad blood. They laid him down. They laid his wrist open and bled him. They realized he was dying, so they opened up his other wrist. He died. They did wrong. Their assumptions were wrong. Their science was wrong. They were wrong. I'm, I'm afraid that our textbooks are dying right now. They're bleeding to death because there's not enough science in there. There's just fantasy. 
it, I, I will stop there. Thank you, Dr. Power. Five minutes. <clears throat> Thanks. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> let me let me uh, appeal to you again uh, to think about when somebody tells you that a fact has been discredited, or a theory, or a part of a theory has been discredited, or it's been shown to be nonsense. Don't take them at their word. Ask for the source. Ask for the text. Right, and evaluate that yourself. And, uh, and look, uh, none of this is to the point. That individual aspects of this or that theory of evolution, they keep talking about evolution, that evolution is nonsense, that evolution is set back thinking, that evolution is being taught to our kids um, and it's a bunch of lie. No one believes in evolution. There are, you know, or that is to say, you cannot just believe in evolution. You have to believe in evolution via some mechanism, right? You have to have a theory of evolution. The current theory of evolution, not Darwin's, but one firmly rested on Darwin's investigations, uh, is as confirmed, folks, as science gets. Now, that is not to say it's proven. That's not to say that bits and pieces couldn't be false. But, um, uh, but that's the nature of science. Right? Which would, brings me to my point, uh, that uh, why should you believe in a scientific theory, scientific theory that apparently threatens um, some of you in the room? I've already told you why I don't think you should be threatened, right? I mean, I really don't. Uh, I think a good course in religious studies or um, a good course in Terry's department would allow you to make some distance between the claims of science and the claims of very religion. Right. Uh, this debate again is um, unfortunate. But anyway, uh, back to why you should believe in uh, this theory. Then uh, I said you shouldn't believe it because it's true. Because who knows, right? The truth is. Um, I think you should believe it because it might be true, right? And hence, it doesn't come for free. You got to work on it. You can't be lazy and accept your preacher's word that the final account is already in that we know what you should think, that we have the final answer and all the answers, and we know why you're important and why you aren't, and we already know that you are important. Maybe you're not, right? Being important, you don't get that for free. You don't get to ascribe yourself a status in your own eyes without doing that critically, without engaging in facts and a uh, um, reasonable inquiry and uh, investigation of the facts. And I don't see much of that um, here today. Uh, because it might be true, there's room for you to make a contribution to this. The Bible is long written, you know. There's theological disputes, and they're very interesting, and uh, there are semantic and hermeneutic tasks to be done, but fun the fundamentals are in. So if you want to uh, know what to think, right, then there's an answer, right? I prefer... Um, uh, a Mayan theory about the origin of the world, right? There's a cave and people come out of the cave and everything. I prefer that one myself. But you're welcome to it. Um, but science just might be right. This theory might be right. And it demands your critical attention and your continued uh, furtherance of that, right? It's not, a done story. it's not a done deal. And any authority that tells you what you think you see, I think you automatically should resist, scientist or otherwise. If you're not... If, there's, if you're not, there's something wrong with you. Um, look, uh, I've already given you another reason to believe it, because it is as confirmed as science gets. And, you know, knock science all you want to talk about ideologies creeping into science and call science just another myth, if you like. I teach a course in philosophy of science. I present that material. My students could tell you that I do a fair job of presenting how ideology and male biases and other kind of political ideals do creep into science. But that doesn't, don't let that take away from the big picture. This theory is, is as confirmed as it could be. And the other reason you should believe this theory is because it's bloody hard, right? Science is hard. Why do you think the universe would be simple or elegant? Why do you think a creation story as pat and as complete and as coherent as this 
would deal and be able to continue to deal with the massive complexity that is the natural world, right? The hardness of science should be a, an appeal to you. It should be a call, a call to you to uh, figure this stuff out, right? Um, there you go. Thanks for your time. This will be the final segment before the question and answer period. This is a rebuttal period, a three minute time limit on each speaker. Kent, three minutes. All right, thank you so much. I'll say, first of all, I do not feel at all threatened by science. Genesis can handle everything science has to throw at it. <clears throat> I think the evolutionists are threatened by real science because the theory of evolution will not stand the light of day. It, it has to have exclusive monopoly in the schools. That's why they don't want creation taught alongside it because it'll look really silly next to something as obviously true as creation. Textbooks will say natural selection is how the process of evolution works. This is what uh, Dr. Pruitt said, and I appreciate him saying this. He said there are uh, natural selection and uh, mutations. Let me just talk about those things. Evolution is really founded on two faulty assumptions, which he admitted here. Mutations are supposed to make something new. Nobody's ever observed that. And then natural selection is supposed to make it survive and take over the population. These are the two cornerstones of evolution. And of course, with iso uh, genetic isolation, it has to get a new species evolve a little better than the rest, and the rest have to die off, of course. The superior survives, the inferior die. That's essential for growth, of course. Hitler certainly believed that and practiced it. Mutations do happen, there's no question. Every known mutation is harmful or fatal or neutral. Or if you do get one that's beneficial, which nobody's ever proven a beneficial mutation, I would love to see one. If you, Dr. Pruitt, if you know of one, please let me know. Who would that mutation, mutated superior one marry? And who would its grandkids marry and great-grandkids marry? It's going to be blended back into the population. If you're going to stake your whole eternity on this, I think you're really on shaky ground. Mutations happen. Here's a five-legged bull. That's a mutant. I want you to notice the bull got an extra leg. He did not get a wing, a feather, or a beak. He already had the gene pool to produce legs. He just built one in the wrong place. That is no new information. It is scrambled existing information. Short-legged sheep, same thing. This is a mutant, but there's no new information. It's scrambled information that pre-exists. Two-headed turtle, that's a mutant. Not ninja, but it's mutant. He's going to freeze first winter. Nobody makes a double neck turtle neck sweater. Mutations are harmful or fatal. It's scrambling up information that is pre-existing. How can you say that's going to create something new? Even Pierre Gross says mutations do not produce any kind of evolution. That's a dead end street if you're going to go on mutations to get you ahead. You get millions of de detrimental ones, never a beneficial one. And then they say natural selection is going to do something for this. This textbook says, this is used in Pensacola here, natural selection causes evolution. Well, that's just a bold-faced lie. Creationists agree natural selection happens, but it's not a creative process to make something new. It keeps the species strong. That's all it does. It can't create anything new. They know that. Natural selection cannot create properties in order to meet adaptational needs. Natural selection doesn't change the product to something else. And we can go on another hour on this topic, but mutations do happen, and they have nothing to do with evolution. And natural selection happens, and that's proof of creation. God wants to make sure the weaker ones are weeded out so the whole gene pool doesn't become weak. It's got nothing. It doesn't change the species to something else. I certainly wouldn't rest my eternity on those two faulty assumptions. Uh, this, is, this is getting so good. If you've got 14 hours worth, I've got at least that much. We should do a course together. Just think of all the money we could make, you know, that'd be great. Uh, all right, now, I'm, gonna, I'm really moved by a couple of things that Kent has said, and I want to I wanna play with this for a second. Genesis can handle everything, and so I'm going to take that premise, and I want to look at Genesis 1, briefly. Uh, and I'm going to do it very quick, because I only have three minutes here. But on the first day, we have the creation of light. Now, I'm not going to worry about the water that was there before. There's something there before God does the light thing. But, and that's been handled, I think, adequately by other people, but on both sides. Light is separated from dark, and we have day and night. And on the second day, the firmament is created, and we have sky and the waters below. And on the third day, the waters are divided, exposing the land. And as a sort of a coda to the third day, the plants are created. 
and the, and the plants of all of the different kinds. Then on the fourth day, God creates the stars and the sun and the moon, the lights that light the day and the night, the things that occupy the day and the night that were created on the first day. On the fifth day, God creates the birds and the fishes. Actually, it's in the other order, the fishes and then the birds, the things that occupy the sky and the sea. And on the sixth day, God creates the animals of all the different kinds. And as an afterthought, because you're not satisfied with what, with the qualities of these animals, not really as an afterthought, he creates humans in his own image. So that distinction between humans and the animals is certainly there in the creation story. Uh, and it's one that has been imbued in, it's an ideology which has been imbued in our philosophy for a long time. My point is, God created, according to this story, precisely the large structure of the phylogenetic sequence of the evolution of the uh, various kinds of animals, although he considers stars, sun, and moon animate creatures, which is kind of an interesting thing. Now, science would tell us today that the universe is billions of light years across. If God created the world 6,000 years ago, then most of the light in the universe that we've studied in our lifetimes should not be here yet. Unless God, of course, created the light already here, which is a curious kind of thing for him to thought about doing. Uh, I'd rather not go through the tortured logic of that. I'd rather flesh out the story of creation in Genesis according to God's natural text, the earth. Thank you. And once again, Mike, you have three minutes. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, before I kick the projector on here in just a second, I wanted to speak to that. Uh, if we're going to talk about contradictions in the Bible or this uh, starlight thing, just go to www.drdino.com. We've got a frequently asked questions uh, page there that answers all these questions, I think, very adequately from a scientific viewpoint. And I want to keep the discussion to evolution, which is what I was told it was supposed to be. Um, I do resent the fact that I'm just uh, making things up, I guess, is basically what you're saying. I gave sources for all my quotes at the bottom of the, of the slides. I've got books on my table from which I drew all my material from. Come check out what I've got. I have nothing to hide. Um, as far as, uh, I guess, uh, the philosophy here of believing in it, it just might be true. I think that's, that's ridiculous. If you're going to stake your eternity on something, perhaps you should stake your, some, your eternity on something that has at least some backbone to it. Let's see here. Can I unblank this? Thank you, sir. Let's take, let's take our eternities on something that has some backbone to it, why don't we? What about some scripture? He that believes on the Son has everlasting life, and he that believes not the Son shall not see life. Neither is there salvation in any other. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I don't think I should get in trouble for that. Uh, we've wandered from the discussion topic already numerous times. You see, the big thing is, is if, since creation is true from my viewpoint, there is a creator. But if evolution is true, there is no creator. And you can't marry evolution with the Bible and claim that you believe in the Bible, or at least that the Bible is, is error-free. See, there's rules if creation is true. There's no rules if evolution is true. There's a purpose to life if creation is true. And there's no uh, purpose at all if you believe in evolution. Folks, it affects every step of your life, everything you think, say, and do, how you react. If creation is true, man is a fallen creature in need of a savior. The Bible actually might be right. If you want to stake your eternity on something that might be right, maybe you should go with something that has not been proven to be wrong. People have thrown stones at the Bible for centuries, but the Bible's still here and people live and die. Man is evolving with no need of a savior if evolution is true. Man brought death into the world if the Bible's true. If evolution is true, death brought man into the world. That's the opposite side of the coin. You can't marry Satan's lie of evolution with the Bible's truth of no evolution and special creation. It just goes on and on and on. It affects everything you do and think and say. It affects a government, how you rule. It affects if you're a racist or not. Well, certainly one species must be better than the other. It's okay to be a racist. if. if if you believe in evolution, folks, it, it deals with your, uh, it changes how you think about government. It changes how you treat your body. If evolution is true, you're just a random uh, sampling of chemicals. If you have a headache, you better take an aspirin. Well, the Bible puts it pretty clear, you know. Uh, God told us to eat the fruit, the vegetable, and the seed, and we're eating the hamburger, french fry, and coke. Okay? You don't take an aspirin. When you, when you take an aspirin, when you have a headache, you're just unplugging. 
I believe that Satan has been using this evolution theory and the resulting thinking since the Garden of Eden to lead people astray. And I think that's all evolution does, is confuse people and lead them astray. There's certainly no point to it. There's no science behind it. There's no facts. See, it's just crazy. I have time up. Thank you very much. Um, right, and I uh, don't feel the need to repeat myself, but I, there was a couple of points made um, uh, that I'd like to respond to. Um, first of all, we shouldn't be begging big questions here about one's eternity and who gets to stake who, whose eternity on what. Um, uh, I don't see my eternity up for grabs here, right? Um, I never had a well-developed sense of my own eternity to begin with, so I didn't lose much. But uh, again, those of you who think your eternity is up for grabs here, I think are missing um, uh, my first point, that this isn't just a debate between uh, science and religion. It's a debate between science, religion, and people trying to make science out of religion, right? My opponents here. Uh, I think they're the ones who are threatening, if, if they are at all, um, your eternity. Um, look, uh, a couple of other things. No one has ever observed speciation, right? New species arising. We keep hearing about dogs making dogs and, and bananas making bananas. and. Um, that's, again, a sophism, right? That's just a kind of verbal trickery, uh, I think. I think it's, uh, I think it's an unfair uh, thing that deserves comment. Um, what, uh, what, what my, our guests here are conceding that changes do occur over generations, right? They're, they do agree that we evolve. And if they believe that, and they're scientists, they have to give us a mechanism by which that happens, right? They have to tell us how is it that we, uh, uh, this variation and uh, development over time, not evolution, I'm not talking about evolution here. Again, that's a buzzword. Um, but just change and variation occurs. They're gonna admit this. Well, once they specify a theory of the mechanism that could possibly account for that, I bet it would look something like evolution by natural selection and the selection being over genes and things at the genes eye level, right? That's what accounts for the variation in us. Um, and once they can see that much, then why can't speciation, right, the differences between us emerge into two different species? Like red squirrels and gray squirrels, right? They happen to be separated by a big body of water and can no longer um, breed, interbreed, right? Uh, why is that so baffling? If you're gonna admit microevolution, Go whole hog, you know, admit biology, evolutionary biology, evolutionary theology, what the hell, geology too. Um, take, uh, accept it all. Um, no one's ever observed speciation. Nobody's ever observed a cat coming from a dog or a man coming from a, from a uh, monkey. That's just bad, right? I never observed what happened to Nicole Simpson, but I'll give you two theories about it. Only one of them will be reasonable, right? Um, even though we, nobody observed it, we could still know reasonable theories from unreasonable ones, right? And evolution through natural selection is much more reasonable than uh, the hodgepodge um, uh, creation science that my opponents have brought here today. Thanks. All right, we have 20 minutes allotted for the question and answer period. And here's, here's what we're going to do so that everybody can hear the question. I'm going to take the portable mic here, and if you have a question, for either table. If you would come to the bottom of the stairs on either side and just form a single line, and I'm gonna take the mic to you and we'll take your questions. I'm gonna ask that a couple of things here. First of all, that you state your name, state whether or not you're a student. Uh, if you're not a student, uh, if you wanna give us just a very brief who you are, uh, just for the sake of the people that are answering the questions for you. And then I'd like to ask you to do this. It, it, you're going to be tempted when you get the microphone, but you're not going to get the microphone. I'm keeping it. Uh, but you want to be tempted to preach a sermon, and what we want, we've got 20 minutes, and we want to give these people a chance to answer your question. So if you will state your question succinctly, that'll help them to have more time to answer more questions. Okay, we got it? Any questions? Oh, I'll just stand up here. Uh, my name is Joel Amnott, and I am a student 
Uh, my question would be uh, primarily to Ken's table. Um, if you throw out the theory of evolution on the basis of it has not been proven and there is no proof for it, then how can you support your position as a scientist as there is no proof for any theory? Uh, the laws of physics or the laws of it, or any of the other laws for that matter have not been proven and they never will be because it is impossible to prove a theory, a scientific theory. So I would ask, how would you defend your position as a scientist? How can you call yourself a scientist and yet throw out something because it's not proven? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, a scientist, the word science means knowledge. A more expanded definition means knowledge we have gained by observation or experimentation. There is no observation or experimentation to say that dogs are going to produce other than a non-dog. So I would say the scientific, the obvious scientific conclusion is that there's some kind of barrier in there where they're only going to create, uh, reproduce after their kind. Secondly, I would point out that you made a good observation. Since you really cannot prove either creation or evolution, uh, you have to kind of, uh, you know, you're saying if we can disprove evolution, how can you prove creation? Uh, I don't know that I could prove it either. But so my, my point would be neither theory is really provable in the scientific sense. So my question back would be, why do all the taxpayers have to pay for one religion to be taught in the school system? Evolution's a religion. Yeah, I think evolution is, if it is a religion, is the, is, uh, is a teaching which is consistent with the vast majority of Christians, with most of Judaism, and with virtually all of the other religious perspectives in the world. My name is uh, Matt Dean, I'm a student at UWF. Um, my question comes from the uh, creationism side here. Um, I found a lot of your analogies. Um, Overgeneralizations and loaded with a lot of uh, self-serving logic, in my opinion. Although some were very succinct and cogent, um, I could pick a variety: the, the rock, the banana, and things like that. But uh, the one that sticks out in my mind the most is um, your example of the fly, the fruit flies, when bombarded with massive amounts of X-rays and microwaves and gamma rays and whatnot, how they um, mutated and were thus rendered, you know, inoperable, you know, sustaining life and how that was supposed to reflect a process of, in the theory of evolution that spans many millions of years. And we're talking about a much more subtle exposure to these types of radiation, which in that quantity is extremely harmful. If you put me in a microwave, I'd fry too. So I'm just wondering in what sense are you, I mean, I'm just curious. So. I'm not sure that I understood uh, what your question was. You, your statement about our examples being self-serving or uh, not accurate. Again, I wish you'd be. I wish you'd be awfully specific. Uh, to me, that's uh, self-serving by the fact that um, you neglected to mention the specifics of this trial test. Um, the specifics of what? This trial, putting fruit flies and okay, the fruit flies. Sure. Okay. Yeah, you gestured into some type of microwave and bombarding them with. X-rays and microwaves? Many things were done to fruit flies to okay. cause them to have mutations. We know that mutations happen because of cosmic radiation, X-rays, a variety of sources. You know, things cause evolution, exposure to chemical, you know, uh, pesticides, things like that. No question. My, and mutations happen. My confusion in this matter, maybe it's me, I'll admit that, um, the way you presented it was that you were offering it in a direct opposition to the process of evolution, which it, by all regards is a very long, slow process not something that, uh, you know, scientists cook up in five minutes in a lab. Okay. How is that supposed to substitute? Okay, that? let me see if I understand. What you're saying is the fruit fly experiment, they did things to, cause, to try to speed up evolution. It was a failure. Nothing happened. So, therefore, that proves it happened slowly. Uh, that's what you're implying. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. What, what evolution do we have? What can we see? What, do, what examples do we have of evolution, regardless of the conditions, fast or slow? Please name your best one. Well, we talk in the fossil record, and we talk to the obvious existence of extinct 
an ancient life form that have all the appearance, unless you believe a very complicated conspiracy theory, they have all the appearance of being millions of years old, right? And also, process of, uh, in hindsight, by our, in hindsight, what looks like the development from one, uh, within one species and across a different species. Um, the record is, you know, there for you to see, but of course, uh, uh, theories do inform perceptual judgments, and um, if you're not open to this theory, you won't make the perceptual judgments by which this, uh, which are explained by this theory, and which support this theory. So again, we're talking past each other, but the point of logic and it being a bad analogy was a very good question, right? Well, I'd like to talk about bad, bad logic and bad analogy. If you find a fossil in the ground, all you know is it died. You don't know if it had any kids, let alone different kids. So the fossil record, even that wouldn't hold up two seconds in a court of law. The fossil record cannot prove anything. These animals died. That's all we know. But if you find one that's got some intermediate features, I, a, a freshman law student could argue, well, this was an extinct species. It doesn't prove it's intermediate between anything. I'm telling you, that wouldn't hold up two seconds. Evolution on trial would, would lose in the first round. Well, There's no uh, evidence for it. Maybe not in a murder court, but certainly in a civil trial it would probably okay. pass. Uh, the, I think I'd like to talk about the probability issue here uh, because this is important. Uh, this is an old question. Uh, it was Hume's question. Basically, what Hume was working on was the question of, you know, gee, this resurrection thing, that, that looks like a miracle. Now, what I want to do is to set out and show that that's possible. That's what Hume was trying to do. What he gave us out of that process was logical positivism. What Hume created was empiricism. And the question was the resurrection of Jesus that led him to that, into that tactic. That, and that changed the direction of Western philosophy in many respects. And probabilities, you know, ask yourself the question, what is the probability that a living human being who dies is going to get up and walk three days later a corporal being? All right. Now, there's a probability to compute. I don't know anybody who's tried to compute it as a probability. That would seem like a sacrilege. So why are we talking about the probability of evolution uh, occurring in the same, you know, I mean, it's, it's not an unreasonable question, but, you know, the probability of a nuclear bomb going off 20 feet over this building in eight seconds is practically zero. Uh, unfortunately, practically zero, not completely zero. But the probability that this building will be nuked someday is fairly high. You have to explain the context. And so. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Sternkey. I'm a student here at the University of West Florida. And um, I guess I would like to hear more about uh, DNA. We talked around genetics. We talked around mutation. Um, didn't talk about Mendel at all. And there, um, you talk about genetics um, and microevolution. And yet the DNA code, um, it, the information about that is expanding. And uh, we hear new things happening with that every day. In fact, that the um, DNA strand may have places on it for all the genetic codes possible. Um, and also, I, I, I have to say um, with Nick that I agree that uh, I wish this wasn't such a polarizing issue. I don't see why we have to um, say one side is right and one side's wrong. But I would like to hear both sides talk about DNA. Just a quick, quick uh, word. Um, uh, Darwin knew nothing about DNA, right? David Hume knew nothing about DNA. And they're responsible for the arguments that uh, apparently threaten some folks here, uh, or worry some folks here, sorry. And um, so DNA could be left out of the equation. But the fact that DNA has given us a mechanism, a naturalistic mechanism, a way to understand the process by which random mutation right, um, uh, plus, you know, reproduction and, and reproducing too many things in your kind and some of them being selected against by their natural environment, uh, that is a crucial uh, element to this process. And uh, DNA adds a, a fundamental building block. I mean, I would be distrustful of Darwin's theory until I heard a mechanism by which this could happen, right? Uh, selection could happen and variation could happen and mutation could happen. But now we have that mechanism. And given that, it satisfies me naturalistically, right? And so I, like Hume, I think, gee, we have an alternative explanation here of how the brilliant variety 
and uh, evolution of species can occur. We don't need to appeal to Genesis anymore. Okay, and I think that's the crux of the whole matter. Some people don't want to appeal to Genesis. Uh, anything else will do, any other theory. Darwin speculated, can you move over just a little bit, that all forms of life have been, are related. This textbook says, this speculation has been verified. The verification of Darwin's theory is supposed to be about the DNA. The DNA, better known as chromosome, the deoxyribonucleic acid, is the most complex molecule in the universe. Average person has about two tablespoons of DNA coming from your 50 trillion plus cells, but if you stretched out the DNA molecule from one person, one person's DNA would reach from Earth to the moon and back five million times, round trips to the moon. The complex code found in one person's DNA that exists in two tablespoons from your body would, is more complex than all the computer codes ever written in the history of humanity combined. And you can throw in Morse code and semaphore if you'd like. The DNA code is unbelievably complex. One person's DNA, if that code was typed out, would fill books that would fill Grand Canyon 40 times. Now, if you want to believe that happened by chance, you're welcome to believe that. But I would say that's not science. That is mysticism. That's religion. That's something you have to believe in. Uh, DNA is incredibly complex. It doesn't happen by chance. I cover a whole section on this on my website, drdino.com, if you want to look at that or take any questions. The DNA code proves an intelligent person, intelligent somebody, wrote this code. Any changes to DNA via mutations are negative. They're harmful. Nobody's ever proven a, a positive one, a beneficial one. So to argue that DNA proves evolution is just simply to be ignorant of the facts. DNA proves creation, not at all for evolution. Get another DNA question. Uh, my name is Kevin Campanile. Uh, I'm a student here. Uh, first of all, I'd like to clarify that not all Christians think like uh, these two gentlemen. Uh, I'm a Roman Catholic, and the Catholic Church has okayed the uh, the idea that uh, that God created an evolutionary uh, descent of where we come from. And the question that I would like to, to ask to the uh, creation side is, if God's timeless, then w what is six days and w what is 6,000 years? And you know, how can you say that, that the earth was created in six days if time is man-made? I, uh, I think I understand the question. You're asking uh, where do we get six-day creation from then? Why not six gazillion years or million years or... Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, the word for day in the Bible is yom, and it can mean day or time period. But when you read the Bible, I should say when you study the Bible, you can get anything out of it you want if you just read it. But if you study the Bible, uh, you always find that these uh, words are defined by the Scripture. Scripture always defines itself. At least in my studies, many times I've read the Bible, I've always seen where Scripture defines its own words. And every time I have seen it used, it, yom means day. Uh, many references just in Genesis alone where God uh, created everything in six days. On the seventh day, he rested. One of the Ten Commandments is uh, about the Sabbath. God rested on the seventh day. He did not rest for uh, millions and billions of years. Uh, he says that we're supposed to rest on the seventh day. We're not supposed to rest for seven million or billion years. We're supposed to rest for a day after working six days. Uh, yes, the word can mean time period, but it always defines itself strictly as day. The plain teaching of the Bible is on the first day, God created this. On the second day, God created that. Now, uh, some people have come up with uh, theories like the gap theory, uh, but the gap theory is unscriptural. It places uh, death before Adam. You have to have death with evolution. There's so many things that have to die over and over and over again before God finally gets it right or chance finally gets it right. And that's what, not what the Bible says. Uh, Adam brought death into the world by sinning. Uh, you see, the gap theory and all these theories that say, like, the day is, uh, with the Lord is a thousand years, it doesn't say millions or billions of years, and it's probably not talking about the time period of the, of the seven-day creation. All these, uh, all these instances, it's stating day, it's saying day. You don't have to have a guru explain uh, the Bible to you. You can read the Bible and, uh, without a preconceived notion of evolution and come away with just simply day. That's what the text is saying. That's what the definitions of the words say. Uh, the scripture supports itself. I think... Um, since, well, that's my time is up. I'm sorry. All right. That's my answer. The past 25 years, uh, and I've spent a good deal of time in Genesis, uh, although it's not, not my favorite place anymore. I prefer the Gospels these days, but 
the I you know I think Mike has stated it fairly well. Uh, the word for day means day, uh, but there's a, there's more. Um, why are we presuming that God cannot write in metaphors uh, if God wrote the text? Because in fact, if you look at the text, there are lots of contentions about who wrote the text. Some say it is the books written by Moses, inspired by God, written in a human vehicle. But why are we asking God not to write in metaphors? In fact, it's entirely possible for God to use the word day as a metaphor. And uh, you know, I believe that if God's responsible for that text, that's exactly what he did. God, if you take the God of Torah, is a very elegant God. If we believe that the God of Torah created DNA, for example, what he created was a phosphate and a sugar which bond with adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil, and, or, and thiamine to create DNA and RNA five substances, six substances, that recreate with each other to create this immensely complex code about which Kent spoke so eloquently. That's the elegant God that speaks in metaphors, that tells us of the world in which we live. And I, th you know, I think Mike is absolutely correct about the day thing. But on the other hand, I still think that day is as a thousand years. It also says that. Yes, my name is Dwayne. I'm a student at UWF. I have a question for the creationism table. So what I'm gathering from all this is that God is incapable of working in a subtle, natural manner and is incapable of expressing that manner as a metaphoric thing, such, very much like what Dr. Pruitt had just said. That's what I'm gathering from your argument. Thank you. Uh, no, I disagree. God's capable of doing that. He's also capable of doing it in six days and writing a book and telling us how he did it and not making it confusing. I think he's capable of doing what he said and saying what he did, and you know he's, he's capable of doing it any way he wanted. And I would point out that for a God to use trickery or subtlety would certainly not be the God that I would want to worship. The God of the theistic evolutionist or the God of the a limited God, which is many people try to put limits on God. What, what really it boils down to, it's man trying to bring God down to our level. Nobody likes the idea of an absolute, all-powerful, un unchanging authority, thus saith the Lord. People just don't like that. And the Bible says in Second Peter chapter 3, in the last days scoffers would come who would be ignorant, walking after their own lusts, who would be ignorant of the creation and ignorant of the flood. And I think that's what we have is people who simply they don't want God telling them what to do because the Bible chaps their hide. Well, I recommend you get some Vaseline because you're going to be judged by that book, okay? <clears throat> I don't think I'll respond to that one. <laughs> Since you brought into the question, uh, since, you know, I didn't ask for it, but you brought it in about the question of going to hell for believing in religion and stuff like that, I just have to bring uh, across the point, um, if we're all uh, made with, you know, de uh, deoxyribonucleic acid, in other words, a chemical, and since our bodies are nothing but chemicals responding to chemicals, and uh, since those chemicals are just exchanging energy, and we're all, and e everything about us, everything that is happening right now, is nothing but a casual exchange of uh, different uh, par parts of energy and stuff like that. You know, I mean, this is just one chemical equation that's happening without anybody saying. You know, maybe God's doing. But my question is: is how come the one chemical equation that produces the thought of believing in God allows you to get in the uh, 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 town of heaven? just because it's that one a chemical equation, or equatable equation, so it could be like, you know, or, or take, say, if it was a, uh, a, like a large equation, it's a derivative of it to produce at a uh, certain, a certain uh, destination. So if it is just this certain destination, 
why doesn't uh, uh, Chris, uh, the creation science go into evaluating the actual equation so they'll have the holy equation? Thank you very much. Excellent question. I think we do evaluate the whole situation. And I, I think your premise, of course, is faulty, that everything is just chemistry. No, uh, chemistry and energy. Chemistry and energy. I think there is more to it. I think uh, man has a spirit. You have a free will. Uh, a good analogy might be I'm 6'1", my wife is 5'0". If I come home from a trip like I did as in Montana yesterday, or where was I, uh, Oregon yesterday, um, if I come home and grab her by the throat and say, you tell me you love me, well, okay, I love you. It doesn't mean anything. God could make us serve him. He could have made it all just chemistry. We could be robots or tape recorders or parrots, walk around, praise God, praise God, praise God, but it wouldn't mean anything. God chose to give us free will, and he chose to give you a free will, and he also gave you a mind and an intellect. Uh, those people who think that their brain is nothing but chemicals that form by chance over billions of years, I often wonder, well, how do they trust their thoughts and their reasoning process then? Uh, nothing can be trusted. That's the uh, idea that, well, we're not really here. You know, no, they can't trust anything. I think there are absolutes. One atheist told me in a debate one time, he said, there are no absolutes. I said, are you absolutely sure? Uh, I think we do have uh, a reasonable, uh, we have a mind that's capable of reason. We also have a free will. And if you don't want to serve God, that's your choice. God gave you a way out. He, he, came to, he loves you so much, he came down to earth and died on the cross to take your place. He really loves you. He wants you to go to heaven. If you don't want to, that's your business. The way is free. It's available. I decided to take it. And you don't have to leave your brain at the door when you study the Bible. Uh, I love science, taught it for years. I have yet to see one scientific evidence presented today in favor of macroevolution. I have yet to see one scientific proof against what the Bible teaches. Everything I've seen, and I've studied both for a long time, says, hey, look, the evidence is overwhelming. This place is complicated. It must have been designed. Complex things don't happen by chance. They take a designer. This building required a designer. One cell in your body is more complex than the space shuttle. It required a real intelligent designer. So I think it's, uh, you ought to find out who he is. And he, he loves you. I know him personally. Good, good friend. Yeah, I, I kind of hope we're not just animated meat. Uh, that would be kind of rough. Um, but that may be the case. Uh, that's a theological, maybe a theological question. It's certainly an interesting question. I want to go go sort of back to something Kent said in interpreting the question. Um, we have soul, or we have we, we have a soul. <laughs> Many of us don't have soul, uh, but we have a soul um, and a spirit. If we if we believe that, then why do we not believe that other things in the universe also have spirit? Especially when Genesis says so. Um, if you look at the word ruach, which occurs in that first line as God began creating the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness was upon the face of the waters and a wind from God or the spirit wind or the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. Gee, spirit wind, the word is ruach. It means spirit, it means wind, it can be interpreted either way. Uh, they're both equally correct and I think it means both which means that God is an animate force in nature, and when you get in the wind, you're in God. When you're walking on the ground, you're on God. Uh, the whole universe is God, and that's a different theological perspective than the one that my opponents would take. It's not one that many people would take in this room, but I think some would. What, how many, what time is it? We'll go five more minutes. Five minutes. Right. Let's give them five minutes. Yeah, sure. Two more questions. I'm sorry. It's going to be two more questions. This one here, and you have your first question is over there. All right, thank you. My name is Eric King, and I'm a graduate from UBF. I have a master's degree from this fine university. Um, but with that, I also took quant apps, quantitative applications. I took research methods. And uh, before this table here, ask, where's your sources, where's your sources? Uh, he's made some very, Dr. Pruitt, I believe it is, has made some very general statements about Christians. Uh, the majority of Christians say this, the majority of Christians say this. Where's your source, first of all? Uh, I'm a Christian, and uh, I, I haven't seen any sources. The other table was kind enough to put the sources on their slides. Uh, I've heard generalizations about Christians believe this, believe this. Have you done the survey? Did you do a random sample? Uh, where's it at? Then... Uh, with the, with the time limit on the six days, 
Uh, Dr. Kent Hovind, I'm sure you can answer this better. Um, but you remember God pre- created the plants on one day, created the sun on the next day. Plants cannot live thousands of thousands of years. And I've, I've learned this from Dr. Hovind. He hasn't had a chance to say this. Uh, but plants can't live thousands of years without sunlight. He can expound on that, I'm sure. Thank you. Um, actually, for, for the fossil record, of course, we use lots of things. On the, on the question about Christianity, um, I have a, an extensive background in the study of religion. Uh, I, I've worked for a number of years not only in scriptural study, but in work with uh, various religious groups. As preparation for this particular debate, I thought I'd better get caught up because I hadn't read a lot of the literature surrounding this debate. And there's a great number of new books. The best one that we found, and both uh, Nick and I looked at this one a lot, I really recommend it for everyone in the room, regardless of which side, is called The Battle of Beginnings. Uh, it's by Del Ratch. And it looks at the way evolutionists and creationists tend to talk past one another. But it also provides a lot of referencing for what major denominations take as uh, acceptable uh, uh, resolution of this question. Uh, another element of it is it gives a very nice discussion of some of the foundations of fundamentalism and the fundamentals and the, and the outgrowth of the fundamentals with regard to creation science specifically. So that's at least one reference. I can provide a lot of other references for my statements on, on religion and theology. Uh, Nick, do you want to add? Uh, just answering the one part on that, uh, there was a multi-parted question there. Uh, most Americans don't believe in evolution. Most Christians don't. This is a Gallup poll right here, uh, 3 of 95, mobile uh, press register right next to it. Uh, I've got here that only 4% in one column and 9% in the other believe in pure evolution, no God at all whatsoever. Perhaps they should go somewhere and start a private school and have people pay to learn that. The majority of American public does not believe this. Uh, it looks like to me 61% here and 47% on the other side say God created the earth in the last 10,000 years. And I am certainly in that part right there. Many people say, well, yes, most scientists believe in evolution. That's true. Right here we have the statistics. 55% of U.S. natural scientists believe in Darwinian evolution. We've also got many other slides uh, from creation scientists showing that uh, these scientists here, they're the ones who determine who's, who gets the grants, who gets their papers published. Uh, all I know of uh, a, a few good um, scientists who started out as evolutionists trying to prove the Bible wrong and they ended up getting saved and became creation scientists. Many of them wrote these books right here. That's not the major- what the majority of believes or even thinks. Uh, it's a minority, but the minority, I guess, is who's in control of our textbooks today and what's being seen on the Discovery Channel and Learning Channel. And that's what eeks me. Uh, and there's just no basis for it. Not everybody believes it and there's no evidence for it. And that's the only part that I'd like to address to it this time. Okay, so the last question. The creation side and not evolution. That means in turn we have to turn around and throw out everything not only that we have learned in science in our life, but all other fields that we have learned in school and any other forms of education as well. Because not what else are they lying to us about? If they're lying to us about this, which is the biggest aspect of who we are. But then if we believe in evolution, we then have to turn around and throw out everything we have been taught and raised to believe religious-wise and God, and then what purpose are we for being here? And as a response to the day situation, I mean, yeah, the Bible says it's a day, but we really have no clue how many hours were in that day. God's daytime was different than our daytime. I mean, if you look at it, in biblical times, there was only 360 days in a year, whereas now we have 365. And here's my question. Here we are fighting and struggling. Um, you must believe this side. You must believe that side. Why aren't the two sides coming together and working and saying to find one uniform belief or something that everyone can believe in? For example, if we take the creation of the world, why aren't we saying, well, perhaps these gases did cause the Big Bang Theory and perhaps that's how it happened. But in the same turn saying, okay, that's how it happened, but perhaps God 
knowingly put those gases there, knowing that they would form and create the world. Okay, what we'll do here, since this is the last question, and we'll give each of the participants, all four of you, an opportunity to respond to that question. So we have two minutes each of you. Uh, if you want, we'll just start with the comments that we're using all week long. Okay. Well, great. Again, I would say God certainly can do anything he wants. I think, uh, though, to do it and then not leave us an owner's manual, a book, and tell us how he did it would be deceitful and silly. I don't think God needs evolution. God doesn't need any help. My, the God that I worship can make it right first time, no mistakes. He, does, he doesn't need any of these uh, uh, processes. I think all the evolution we have seen is microevolution, variations within the kind. Now, to me, that's a smart God who plans ahead because he knows the creatures are going to encounter some various different uh, environments where they might have to adapt to a certain environment. They may have to have longer hair or shorter hair, depending on the cold or warm climate. So he puts in their gene pool the ability to produce a variety of offspring that can adapt to these various environments. Uh, they're still the same kind of animal. It's no contradiction to scripture. And to me, that's, that's really planning ahead. It's sort of like General Motors putting a heater and an air conditioner in some of their cars. You know, well, they don't know if it's going to go to warm climate or cold climate. That's not dumb, even though an air conditioner and a heater do the opposite thing. That's planning ahead. And so I think the God that I worship planned ahead and gave uh, gene pools quite a, quite a variety. And they're capable of, you know, a lot of adaptation. People can live in Alaska and adapt to, you know, 20 below, or they can live in the desert and adapt to 110 above. But they're still people. They're still interfertile. That's not really evolution. So we don't see any of that. Uh, and as far as throwing out the studies, you know, because evolution is taught in so many courses, it's not just science. It's scattered throughout history, throughout philosophy, throughout uh, English courses even will have it, you know, and mathematics courses will have evolution stuff thrown in. I agree. We've got a lot of work to do. We need to rewrite all these books. We need to get busy. Uh, I, you know, I think this was a, a great question, and, and it's one that we all should respond to. Um, when I teach, uh, I do not require my students to believe any particular thing, least of all uh, what I believe, per se. Uh, I expect my students to learn about evolution, what evolutionists are saying, so that they have a correct and, uh, um, um, and complete understanding of both the processes and the data that are presented in the textbooks and, in, and by scientists. That way, they can use their own critical judgments to decide one way or the other. I have many students, probably a few here today, who have come into my classes and said, I don't believe in evolution, I believe in the Bible, uh, and they don't want to be challenged in, uh, in, in ways that are going to make them feel uncomfortable in class, and I do not challenge them in ways that make them feel uncomfortable in class. It's my attitude that uh, if a Christian comes into my class, they get treated with the same respect as anyone else. And uh, then we concern ourselves with the issues in science, and if a person leaves the class with uh, one view or another, a theistic evolutionary view, a non-evolutionary view, whatever view they have, I hope that they have the logical tools to argue their positions and to help us resolve the question in precisely the way in which you've asked us to resolve it. Thanks for that question. If you're watched on TV or seeing the movies, you should really uh, decide if it's right or wrong because I think most of what's being pushed is garbage. Uh, it's not just our science textbooks. If you look at our social studies books, or when I was in third or fourth grade, I was taught that this country was uh, founded on Christianity and the Bible. Uh, today, the kids are being taught it was founded on the freedom of religion. Uh, that's not what I was taught. Uh, I think this has affected a lot of fields. We've shown how it affects everything you think, say, and do. It's either creation or evolution. It's either God or it's not God. Why not lump both together? Because they're total opposites. You've got God, you've got Satan. Total opposites. You cannot mix God's truth with Satan's lies. That might be pretty funny to some of you, but I tell you what, Satan's the ultimate pervert. And what he cannot steal from you, he will pervert. He'll do a 180. He'll take uh, the creator and make him part of the environment, which is what's been said already. It's a Disney religion. 
Well, God is above and beyond his creation, and he still loves us. He, uh, he knows our thoughts. He still loves us. Uh, you know, Satan is closer to you than you are yourself, yet Satan will pervert that and make God seem far and distant, like he can't even be a part of this creation or help you out. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the creator and the sustainer. Yet, uh, you know, Satan will take that from you and, and make you think, you know, you evolved from a monkey and you're on your own. These people just don't want God telling them what to do. I think that kids are getting an indoctrination and not an education together. You cannot lump the truth, which there are absolutes, and you cannot lump lies together. It's one or the other. I think anything that I say or Kent says or what you learn here at the school or see on TV, you had better uh, use your eyes and all of your brain on because a lot of it's uh, not true. You're going to have to pick and choose. It, your dentist, your eternal destiny does, uh, uh, where you're going to end up forever, it does matter on how you live and what you choose to believe. Uh, it's that important. Um, that's the best I can put it. Um, the God of the Bible, uh, I'm sorry, my time is up. <laughs> What's your name? What's your name? Donna. Donna. Yeah, uh, Donna. That was a, uh, I think, a very direct and heartfelt question, and uh, deserves a direct uh, answer. Um, uh, I don't think you ought to be that conflicted fundamentally, uh, for reasons I've already said. Um, at most, what has happened today, right, is that we've provided you some grounds to doubt one of the ways by which men have argued for the existence of their uh, creator, right? That way is to look at the natural world and, and see design in it, and to see order and harmony and beauty in it, and to argue from there, to infer from there to an orderly, uh, creative, and um, harmonious uh, being, right, outside of that. It, we've given you some doubts in, in, insofar as that is a line of reasoning um, that's reputable. Uh, to begin with, I mean, Hume already poked holes in that way before Darwin, right? So uh, that's not the best way you can argue for the existence of your creator anyway. And that's what most of what's happened today. Uh, but the kind of compromise that you mentioned at the end, you know, how come you experts and academic academicians and um, uh, writers of textbooks can't come up with a coherent answer to our, our troubles here? That's a profound question. But I don't think those guys have the grounds on which they can give you an answer. They can't compromise, you know? They absolutely cannot compromise. Uh, uh, to hear that he's uh, reviewing high school textbooks horrors me. I'm horrified that this guy has a, a serious job in determining what textbooks high school students use. Um, and I, use, I mean that with all respect. I mean, I think you're a very uh, charming guy and everything. But um, uh, I think they're inc incapable of compromising. But I think there's other f folks out there. I mean, uh, uh, theistic evolution is one. The statement you were talking about, uh, that's just a statement of theistic evolution. That's one answer. And there are others out there. I don't think an answer is coming from science, creation science. Thanks for coming, you all. I appreciate your time. I want to I wanna thank Chuck. Chuck? Will you, I want to, you know, Chuck is not used to having to sit and listen quite this much. Would you, would you like to say something? All right. Okay. Please come and, and meet us, enjoy, and come meet Dr. Hall.